Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. I am Dr. Siddharth Warrior and today we are talking about eating. You know that thing that we do when we are bored or lonely or sad or happy or sometimes hungry. Food is a very important part of our social connections. We divide our day by breakfast, lunch and dinner. Our romantic life would be non-existent if we didn't have the excuse of food to call somebody out for a date. In my family and maybe in yours, the conversation around breakfast would be what is there for lunch and in lunch it will be dinner ke liye kya ban hai. So it's safe to say that food plays a very important role in our lives. And why not? Good yummy food is a pleasure to have and it is so important for us to survive. But as a neurologist, I am fascinated by the connection between food and the brain. So today we are going to take a deep dive into the neuroscience of eating. But before we do that, a quick thanks to the sponsor of this video, Ultra Human. Ultra Human is a CGM sensor, that is a continuous glucose monitoring system. I have been using Ultra Human for the last one month to continuously monitor my blood sugar levels 24 7. And I can see the blood glucose variability, that is, how much my sugar levels go up and down depending on what I'm eating. That kind of feedback has helped me change my lifestyle. And if you want to join this experiment, you can click on the link below, join the Ultra Human project, and skip the waiting list. Back to the video. We are going to be talking about the neuroscience of eating under three main headings. Number one, why do we eat? And here we are also going to talk about why some people have binge eating problems. Number two, what are some foods that are good for the brain and what are some foods that are bad for the brain? And number three, how does fasting affect the brain? And the third part is going to be taken directly from my workshop that was done on basics of neuroscience. With that, let's move on to the first question, why do we eat? One way to look at it is that we eat because we must. Our brain is wired to go out and look for food so that we can have energy to do all the things we want to do. Whenever the body is low on energy, it sends signals to the brain. The brain feels the desire to eat, what we call as appetite, and it initiates food-seeking behavior. The part of the brain that does this is called hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is a small part of the brain that actually controls all the autonomic functions, that is all the involuntary actions that are happening in the body, the hypothalamus is in charge. Whether it is controlling your temperature, whether it is controlling your heartbeat, whether it is controlling your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, your digestion, your endocrine systems, all of this is being controlled in the hypothalamus and feeling of hunger and thirst are no different. Within the hypothalamus is a part called as arctuate nucleus and in the arctuate nucleus are orexin neurons. Orexin comes from the Greek word orexis which means desire and orexin is what gives you the desire to eat. You may have heard of anorexia. In this condition a person does not feel any desire to eat. So the arctuate nucleus controls our willingness to eat or not to eat. But how does the hypothalamus make that decision? For that it asks the body. There are two hormones released by the gut that tells the brain whether it should eat or not. Those two hormones are ghrelin and leptin. Ghrelin is released in the stomach and whenever the stomach is empty, the ghrelin level goes up. That tells the brain that it is time to eat. Whereas when we are full, the leptin level in our body goes up and leptin in turn tells the hypothalamus that it is time to slow down. You don't have to eat anymore. So this is one practical, mechanical way of thinking about food. When we are low on energy, we eat and replenish our energy stores. But food is a lot more than that. Food is a source of pleasure, of enjoyment, and this is where our dopamine pathways kick in. When we eat food that we like, it triggers the dopamine networks and activates our reward pathways. In the brain is an area called as nucleus accumbens, which is the site of action of dopamine. This is where our pleasure system operates and this is also the reason for addiction. Binge eating is a pathological condition where somebody has a compulsive need to keep looking for food and to keep eating it. This is because in this condition, food becomes an addiction. Part two is what to eat. There are some foods that have been proven to have a benefit on your brain while other foods have been shown to have a negative impact. So let's look at some of the foods to eat to improve your brain health and some foods to avoid. 
Number one is omega-3 fatty acids. This is found in dietary fish, in kiwi, in chia seeds, in flax seeds, in walnuts. Why is this important? There is a molecule called docosahexanoic acid or DHA. DHA is one of the most important components of the cellular membranes of the brain cells. It constitutes almost 30% of the neuronal membranes. And this is not a molecule that our body can produce. That means that it can only come through our diet. It is crucial for maintaining the integrity of the membranes of our brain cells. Deficiency of DHA has been linked to depression, ADHD, dementia, bipolar disease and schizophrenia. And some studies have shown that omega-3 fatty acids can reduce the damage after a traumatic brain injury. Second is dietary polyphenols. Polyphenols have powerful antioxidant properties and they can increase the recovery of our brain after any injury or disease. The two major food groups that have polyphenol activity are flavonoids and curcuminoids. In India, curcumin is widely available as turmeric, which has been traditionally known for its antioxidant and healing properties. Studies have shown that curcumin has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and anti-amyloid properties. And there is some evidence that it can actually improve cognitive function in patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease. The other group with polyphenol activity are flavonoids. This can be found in fruits, vegetables, berries, tea, red wine. Flavonoids also have antioxidant properties and they improve neuronal function by increasing nerve signaling. That is how well neurons can talk to each other. Green tea is high in flavonoids and some studies in China have shown green tea to reduce the effect of aging on brain function. Green tea has been shown to improve memory and also protect the blood-brain barrier in case of brain damage. So while these are some things that you should be consuming to improve your brain health, there are other foods that you should definitely be avoiding because these can actually cause harm. The two most important things that you should be avoiding to protect your brain are transaturated fats and refined sugar. Both of these reduce the levels of BDNF, that is brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is an extremely important chemical in the brain. BDNF is responsible for forming new synapses, that is brain connections, increasing the strength of existing synapses and it helps you in learning and forming new memories. Studies have shown that a high calorie diet rich in transaturated fats and refined sugar leads to increased levels of oxidative stress in the brain and reduced synaptic plasticity, that is you find it more difficult to learn quickly. And this can be actually reversed by antioxidant treatment and exercise. We'll be talking about the effect of exercise on your brain in another video coming out very soon. So if you want to see that, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And that brings us to the last part of the discussion, which is how does fasting affect the brain? Fasting is a natural thing. Like I said, we do it all the time. We do it every night when we go to sleep. Binge eating at night breaks the fast and it is extremely harmful. Every culture in the world has some kind of fasting and they all recommend fasting. Why? First of all, fasting is different from caloric restriction. So caloric restriction is reducing the number of calories that you eat, but the meal frequency is maintained. You still eat every four hours, five hours. Fasting is when you are increasing the distance between your meals and you are not putting in any calories during that time. What is the effect of fasting on the brain? basically increases BDNF levels. And as your BDNF increases, your synaptic plasticity increases, your cognitive skills increase. And secondly, as you fast, you are reducing the free radicals in your body. Low number of free radicals, less neuronal damage, less neural damage, the more your neurons will survive and your aging will slow down. The reason that this is so basic is because it is not new. Right from the time unicellular and multicellular organisms were figuring out how to survive in the environment, they figured out that periods of fasting is going to be essential. We are not going to find food. And so everything has been built around the principle that we are not going to get to eat every day. And so let us build on this assumption. Adaptive response is a very interesting thing that happens in our body when we start to fast. In the first 12 to 24 hours, our glucose levels drop. Glycogen storage in the liver reduces. So glycogen is where glucose goes and stores in the liver. Once glycogen drops, our body needs energy. So we cannot rely on the liver anymore. 
सो वी स्विच ओवर टू अर नॉन हिपैटिक ग्लूकोज यूटिलाइजेशन मतलब लिवर के अलावा कहाँ पे ग्लूकोज मिलेगा वी लुक एट फैट फैट डिराइव कीटोन बॉडीज फ्री फैटी एसिड्स नाउ द होल बॉडी कैन यूज फ्री फैटी एसिड्स बट द ब्रेन के नॉट सो द ब्रेन यूजेज कीटोन बॉडीज दिस इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ कीटो डाइट द बेनिफिट्स ऑफ मेकिंग दिस स्विच फ्रॉम कॉन्स्टेंट ईटिंग टू कैलरी कैलरी डेफिसिट is huge it increases your network plasticity it increases stress resistance neurogenesis it reduces free radicals the effect is seen across the whole body so even in your heart in your muscles in your brain in your gut in your kidneys in all the vessels in your body the free radical damage reduces it reduces the chances of your heart attacks it increases your metabolism power in your liver so a lot of benefits to intermittent fasting so that was the neuroscience of eating in 12 minutes if you have any questions at all let me know in the comments below and i'll try to answer as many as i can so how does ultra human help me in this journey of fasting and being mindful of my diet just like when we go to the gym we take certain measurements like body weight arm circumference waist circumference and we use that as a feedback to know if we are on the right track similarly when i'm eating ultra human is able to provide me with real time feedback as to how what i'm eating affects my blood sugar levels for instance a couple of days back i had a particularly heavy meal and i saw my blood sugar levels go way beyond the upper limit that i had set that reminded me that i should be more mindful of what i'm eating for the next meal so it is those small little feedback loops that help me stay on track if you want to try out the ultra human experiment yourself you can click on the link below and join the project if you like this video hit that like button share this with your friends subscribe to the channel and i will see you soon in the next video where we talk about how exercise affects the brain see you guys